Dear Lord, we come before you this morning and we are just in awe of the wonder of you. My heart just is, is just so tender to you this morning after singing these songs of worship and praise, of reaching out my heart to you, of, of asking for you to cover me and to hold me and to love me. I just want you. I want more of you. And so, Lord, I pray that as we open up your word, that you would become what we need. You are Yahweh, after all, the becoming one. Become what it is that we need deep down in our hearts this morning as we study your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 14, we're beginning in verse 15, and these final verses of chapter 14 are about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is really one of the best kept secrets of Christianity. And you say, best kept secrets? What are you talking about? You hear about the Holy Spirit all the time, you know, the Spirit prompted me to do this and that, and you know, I'm really filled with the Spirit, and you know, what do you mean it's one of the best kept secrets? Well, what I mean by that is because I believe that the, the role and purpose of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer has been misunderstood and has been misapplied. And in our day today, I think the Holy Spirit has been relegated to the role of the grand showman rather than what he really is. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. The Holy Spirit, you see, is not something for you to make you look cool, to do really cool things so that people are impressed. The Holy Spirit is not the force. The Holy Spirit actually works in the background, like the BIOS of your computer. And most of you probably don't even know what that is, do you? Anybody ever? Too many of you know what that means. <laughs> yes, that was the geekometer out there, right? <laughs> BIOS stands for, how, can you t how many can you tell me what it stands for? Okay, it stands for Basic Input-Output System. And basically, <clears throat> no pun intended, it's at the heart of your computer. If you didn't have a BIOS, your computer wouldn't know what to do. And Windows Vista wouldn't run as well as it does. <laughs> That's right. The, the BIOS sits at the very heart of your computer and it tells everything what to do and it's the, it's the traffic cop and it's what enables everything to work. But you don't know what the BIOS is. You don't ever touch the BIOS. You don't ever really think about the fact that your computer has a BIOS and that's kind of like how the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit in your life works for one purpose and that is to make your life work effectively for the glory of God. The Holy Spirit is also a foretaste of heaven. He is the beginning of what it is like to live in God and have God live in us. I'll explain more about that in a little bit. And it's broken up this section of John chapter 14 into kind of two sections. Verses 15 through 24 are what the Holy Spirit is to us as believers in Jesus Christ. And then verses 25 through 31 are what the Holy Spirit does in us. And one of the things that we're going to talk about is that the Spirit gives us assurance that we belong to God's family and assistance for us to live in God's will. So assurance that we belong to God's family and assistance to live in God's will. Think about those things as we go through these verses. Beginning chapter 14 verse 15. Jesus starts out saying, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now just that verse right there in and of itself kind of sounds like Jesus is introducing sort of a rules-based religion here. If you love me, you'll do what I say. 
But really what this is, is telling us that it all starts with a relationship with Jesus Christ. Loving Jesus is where it begins. And then as a byproduct of loving Jesus, you start to become like him. Becoming like Jesus basically means that you start thinking like Jesus would think. You start acting like Jesus would act. There's the famous, now famous saying, you know, what would Jesus do? Isn't that right? WWJD, what would Jesus do? You see that everywhere around. At first I thought it was a new radio station. But that didn't, that wasn't it. You know, what would Jesus do? And it's, uh, it, the, the saying is kind of like, well, let's think about a situation and apply the golden rule and then we'll know what to do. And the role and the purpose and activity of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer is so much deeper than that because you no longer need a bumper sticker to remind you to look somewhere to see how you might apply it to life. Because the Holy Spirit lives in you, you begin to think and act like Jesus would naturally. But it all starts with a relationship. John, who penned this gospel, also wrote some letters. And in his first letter, he talks a little bit more about this. This concept of, if you love me, you will keep my commandments in 1 John 5. Just jot the reference down if you want, verses 2 through 5. He said this, By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So let me back my way through that verse to show you what I mean. First, we believe in Jesus. That's faith. It's trust. It's reliance. It's confidence in him. Faith that leads to an overcoming of the world, which is the result of being born of God. And that overcoming of the world is basically not doing what the world wants and doing what God wants. In simple terms, when you come to a relationship by faith in Jesus Christ, you are born again of God and that new life in you overcomes the old life of the world. So the result is you love God and obey his commandments. It's not an external thing that we look out to. It's an internal thing that is being born in us. And I thought and thought and thought about What's the best analogy to describe this process? And everything seemed to fall short, except for one, and that's the caterpillar. The lowly caterpillar. Going along the ground, climbing up the tree. Dum -da -dum -da -dum. He's real slow. The early bird, you know, chomp and he's gone. Seems so weak and vulnerable, so lowly ugly most of the time. The caterpillar crawls up on a leaf and starts chomping away. Eating and eating and eating and eating. And then one day, the caterpillar decides he's going to draw a web around himself. He tucks himself into a cocoon and just waits. But something happens while he's in that cocoon. That one day when that cocoon breaks open, no longer a caterpillar is found inside, lowly, dumpy, slow, and ugly. But what emerges from the, ca the, the cocoon is an extraordinarily beautiful butterfly with bright, colorful wings. No longer slowly crawling along the ground, the butterfly can fly away and do things the caterpillar could never have dreamed of. And the process that takes place within that cocoon is called what? Metamorphosis. 
And that is, that comes right from the Greek word that describes the process of change that occurs in the life of the believer through the agency of the Holy Spirit in your life. We have misunderstood the Holy Spirit to be like touching an electrical outlet, right? It's like, I need a charge. My cell phone's running down. I need a quick charge. So I plug into the Holy Spirit and then suddenly everything comes to life. We were out camping um, over spring break and uh, we were just kind of going along and everything and, and then all of a sudden all these clicks happened and the lights went out and the stuff stopped working and we went, uh-oh, what happened? And we went over to the little breaker box and, you know, flipping it back and forth and nothing's changed and I was just pulling my hair out, you know, great way to start your vacation, right? <laughs> Finally, as it turned out, the, the breaker box somewhere down the line at the campground had, had blown, and so the guy had to go and reset it. He said, oh, yeah, it's an old system, and when it's wet, tends to blow real easy, so, you know. But that's kind of how we think about the Holy Spirit. And when we don't feel the Spirit, it means that the breaker's been, been thrown. And when we, you know, want that extra charge in the Spirit, we just throw that switch over, and then, oh, I'm super Christian. But you know, I think, I don't think that's how the Holy Spirit works in the life of the average garden variety believer on a day-to-day -day basis. It's less like the big electric charge and more like the quiet metamorphosis of the caterpillar into the butterfly. God is changing you. The Holy Spirit is beginning to make you think and act like Jesus, so then when you step out to then do those things for the Lord, that's when the power of the Spirit comes along and does incredible things. And we sort of have it backwards. We want that power first. So we've gone all through, uh, through all of one verse. I promise we will go a little faster. But it starts with relationship. So then, verse 16. And I will ask the Father... And he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So Jesus says that he will ask the Father and the Father will send another helper and the, the word there for another is another of the same sort. Not, a, not another as in a different kind. The, the Greek word, of, would, word would have been heteros that was used there. But this word means another of the same sort. So the Father's going to send something like he's already sent before. Another helper. Now to me that says, who was the first helper? It was Jesus. And he says right here, the, the world can't know him or receive him because that only comes through the relationship with Jesus. But you know him because he's been with you. He's dwelt with you. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He calls him a helper. Now that's translated various different ways in uh, out of the Greek. Uh, the Greek word parakletos is sometimes translated helper or counselor or advocate. It literally means called to one's side. Called to one's side. It was a legal term. Have you ever been in a court of law where there are, are, they are doing arraignments? I've, uh, not, I've had the opportunity to do that but I should clarify, not because I was a defendant, but in uh, I used to be a, a reporter and I had the uh, opportunity, challenge, whatever, to sit through a number of arraignments. And what you would see is a defendant, their, their, their cause would be called, you know, probably seen it on TV, you know, State of Oregon versus so-and-so, case number CV15644, you know, and so then the person comes forward, and the next thing the judge says is, um, who is your attorney? And if the person does not have an attorney, then there's this whole group of attorneys that sit along to one side or kind of in the back, and they're just waiting, and it's kind of a, 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 a 
next in line sort of system where if you're first up, the judge says, okay, uh, your attorney's going to be so and so. And that person is called up alongside of the defendant to be their advocate in court, to defend them in these legal proceedings. That's the word that's used for the Holy Spirit. And that's one of the reasons that sometimes the word is translated advocate. <clears throat> and it's someone who comes alongside to care at the appropriate time. Now the roles of the Holy Spirit that are mentioned just here in this section and, in, and a little bit later in the chapter are he is an advocate as I mentioned. He's also called the spirit of truth. Very important. In verse 26 he's called a teacher and also a reminder of Jesus. So then the Holy Spirit's role in our lives is as we see here first of all it's a gift. We don't earn the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> It is given to us as a personal request from Jesus Christ. This gift, Jesus says in verse 16, is to be with us forever. So it's a permanent gift. Someone always with us. Verse 17, the Spirit is someone to be known. And someone that the world, the cosmos, cannot receive. So the relationship that you have with the Holy Spirit is not something that people outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ can have. Absolutely crucial for us to understand. Now, how do you receive him then? That comes in verse 23. We'll see that in a little bit. The Spirit also, verse 17, dwells with us and will be in us. Now, that's important for what Jesus was saying to, to his disciples right then. The Spirit was dwelling with them in Jesus Christ and would be in them after his resurrection when Jesus said, receive the Holy Spirit. And then finally, as we'll see in verse 23, the Spirit makes his home in us. Very, very important. So the Holy Spirit, companion, confirmer, comforter, counselor. Verse 18. I will not leave you <clears throat> as orphans. I will come to you. The disciples were worried about that, as we saw at the beginning of chapter 14. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. And that was exactly what happened. After Jesus' resurrection, the general population no longer saw him. But those disciples who were close to him, at, uh, at one point, as many as 500 people saw him resurrected. You will see me. And then he says, because I live, you also will live. They didn't understand that at this point. They didn't know what Jesus was talking about. But this is one of the core truths of understanding the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, salvation is not just something like plugging yourself into a power outlet <clears throat> and so now I have power now I have life if I unplug then my power goes out Jesus Christ in dying voluntarily laying down his life as a way of purchasing us of ransoming us from the kingdom of darkness then when he raised again to from the dead, his life, this new resurrection life, then becomes our life. He gives it to us. And because he lives, we also will live. And in verse 20, in that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. What are the commandments of Jesus that he talks about here? Well, chapter 13, just a few moments really before, he said the commandment was to love, to love one another. 
John came back to it as we saw there in his, in his epistle, 1 John. But notice how this flows. <clears throat> if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, in verse 21, it says, if you keep my commandments, you love me. So, which way is it? Is this kind of double speak? What's going on? No. Basically, I think what he's saying is, if you love me, I will be in you, I will teach you, and I will metamorphize you. I will transform you into a person that wants to and actually has the power to be like me. Verse 22, Judas, and John points out very clearly, not Judas Iscariot, who was gone by this point. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. This is one of the coolest things in this section, I think. Found there in verse 23. It starts with love, like I said. It starts with a relationship. You love Jesus. And if you love him, that's all that matters. That's all it takes. And then that's followed by three wills. Three things that will happen as a result of that love relationship. He will keep my word, Jesus says. The Father will love him. And then both Jesus and the Father will come and make a home in him. And that's the Holy Spirit. The three in one. The Trinity. God making a home in in you. Now the word there means uh, a staying or a residence. Now what I think is so cool about this is that the only, one of the only other places this word is used and certainly the only place it's used in this kind of a context in the entire New Testament occurs earlier in this chapter. Look back a little bit to the beginning of chapter 14 where he says, let not your hearts be troubled, believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. And if you have the King James Version, that probably says many mansions. That same word that's used for the dwelling places, the permanent abode that we will have in God in heaven is the same word that Jesus uses to describe he and the Father and the Holy Spirit coming to make a home in your heart. A permanent place of residence. That's what it's like to be in the Father and the Father in us. We can experience what Jesus experienced and talked about over and over again. It starts with loving him. Then his spirit comes and takes up that, that permanent residence in our hearts. And then, when it's all said and done, then we go and we take up permanent residence in God's heart. In heaven. But then there are those, Jesus said, who do not love me. And those that choose not to love Jesus will not become like him. You can't do that on your own. Just to decide one day, you know, I think the golden rule is a good way to live my life and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apply that very strictly and I'm going to follow it to the letter and I'm going to be so righteous and so good, you're going to look at me and my life and you're not going to be able to distinguish it between another person who you claim is a Christian. I'm going to be so righteous and it's all going to be on my own. Great sentiment, impossible to do, and it's kind of irrelevant anyway, because all it takes is just one thing to separate you from God. And that one thing actually is to be born, because we're born <laughs> as those separated from God. But you can't do it on your own. You can only do it if you love Jesus. So then verse 25, these things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the helper, or the comforter, 
the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So the Spirit is the Son's representative, even as the Son was the Father's representative. And what the Spirit does in us, I'll just kind of recap and, and, and go forward a little bit from this chapter even. He'll be with us forever, like I said. The world at large can't receive him. He lives with us and in us. He teaches us. He reminds us of Jesus' words. Later on, we'll see that he convicts us of sin, shows us God's right way, and announces God's judgment on evil. He guides us into truth and gives insight into future events. And finally, he brings glory to Jesus. Verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled neither let them be afraid. This is among the most precious and wonderful things I think that Jesus Christ ever said while he was with us here on earth. Now you can be sure that his disciples were pretty upset at the fact that Jesus was saying, I'm not going to be with you much longer. But not only did he promise to send them a comforter in the Holy Spirit, but he promised them that that comfort would come in the form of peace. And not just any peace, but Jesus' peace. Paul would later call it the peace that passes understanding, that goes beyond our ability to comprehend. It's different than the peace of the world. The peace of the world is the absence of conflict. When there aren't any wars being fought, we say we are at peace. But peace in Jesus is not the absence of conflict. It is the presence of the Spirit in the midst of conflict. And I think that's a crucial thing for Christians to understand. Because we take our understanding of peace from the world. And we think, as long as everything's going pretty cool in my life, I am at peace. I'm not sick. I'm not in financial stress. I'm getting along with my family, okay. Getting along with my neighbors, okay. Getting along at my job, most of the time, even though I hate it. I'm not saying that for me. I love my job. But you know what I mean? It's like as long as there's not the latest crisis going on in our lives, we think, okay, whew, I'm at peace. And we misunderstand. Jesus also said, um, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives. In the world, you will have tribulation. So run around like a chicken with your head cut off, screaming at the top of your lungs and panicking all the time. Oh, wait, that's not how it goes, does it? He said, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. As a Christian... There's one of the promises that doesn't really make it into the spirit promise Bible verse box that you have in your kitchen window. And those are the verses like what Jesus said to the Apostle Paul, I will show him what he must suffer for my name's sake. And we gauge how successful and how mature we are as a believer by how few problems we have in our life. One of the most mature and most successful Christians who ever lived, my hero, the Apostle Paul, I don't think you could characterize his life as a bed of roses. The man was a walking trouble magnet. Everywhere he went, it seemed like people just suddenly wanted to stone him to death. I don't know what it was. Whenever he was on a ship, the ship went down. I'm surprised that they sold him tickets, you know. Oh, you're on our watch list. We, wanna, we want the ship to make it to its port, so you're not getting on board. 
Everywhere he went, people argued with him. People tried to kill him. People starved him. Was Paul immature? Let's see. Wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Probably not. Gave us the most complete understanding of God that we have in explaining the Old Testament, in explaining the work of Jesus Christ. Paul's life was very much lived in the midst of trouble, and yet he was at peace. Peace is the presence of the Spirit in the midst of trouble. Are you agitated or afraid, as those two words there say? It need not overwhelm you if you have the Spirit of Jesus living inside you. And that's because he promised us never to leave us or forsake us. He promised to bring us safely to be by his side in his heavenly abode. He promised that in Jesus there is no enemy that can really defeat you. The enemy prowls about like a roaring lion. But if we hold fast in the Lord and are in his peace, that enemy's roar has no bite to it. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I'm going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced. Because I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you. For the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. But I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise. Let us go from here. He's telling him, don't hold on to me physically. Because I can do so much more by going back to the Father and asking him to send the Holy Spirit. And I think that part of Jesus' message to his men was expect the Holy Spirit. Expect this person to come and take up residency in your life and have an effect. I think that sometimes, you know, we, we think of salvation kind of like getting a, a ticket to a cruise, right? If you've ever bought a cruise ticket, some, you know, you, most of the time you have to do it way in advance. And so you, you go online, right, and you figure out what cabin you want to be in, and you sign up for it, and then you get your ticket. You print it out on your computer, or they send it to you in the mail, or whatever, and you put it away in your strong box. And you hope you're not like me, who forgets tickets when we leave to go places. Not anymore, though, right? I've learned my lesson. It wasn't a cruise, though. Uh, one time we were... Uh, this was quite a few years ago, but we were going to go to the World's Fair in um, Vancouver, British Columbia. That shows you how long it was ago, if you go Google World's Fair. And we, uh, we lived in Medford at the time, so, and we were driving. And we were a young family, very poor, and so we actually borrowed my uncle's um, trailer bed. It was an old pickup bed that he had tra tr made into a trailer and built this little house over it. And that's where we were going to stay while we were in Vancouver. And we drove all the way up there pulling it by our little Nissan station wagon. And uh, it was, it was, it was uh, even so heavy for that that I could feel the transmission heating up, you know, as we're going along the freeway. Um, and so then we get to Vancouver and we were so poor we had to camp, right? So we they made all these camping places for people to stay. And uh, I don't know if ours was actually called this, but it should have been called like Mosquito Swamp or something. Because literally, we had to, we, we slept in the back of the station wagon, the kids slept in this little trailer, and we had to run just from the station wagon back to the trailer to keep from getting eaten alive by these mosquitoes. So we're thinking, not an auspicious beginning to our trip to the World's Fair. But this is all going to change, because tomorrow we're going to go into the entrance, and we're going to have such a good time, and we get up to the entrance, and I'm going, you've got the tickets, right? No, you're in charge of the tickets, Tom. Uh-oh, I'd forgotten the tickets. Anyway, it all worked out fine. 
and I've never forgotten tickets since. <laughs> But you know, sometimes we think of salvation like we've bought a ticket to something really cool and really special and we pack it away and nothing really happens until the point at which we're ready to go on the cruise or head out to the World's Fair, climb on board, and then we grab our tickets and we go to heaven. But there's so much more to that if we expect the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives right now to invade us to take up residence. And the Holy Spirit is not like one of those roommates that you kind of say, this is your bedroom over here. I won't go in there. Don't let any of your stuff come out into here. <laughs> That's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit moves into every room of your house, of your life. And he becomes active, whether you like it or not, in everything that you are about. How much, then, do you expect the presence of the Spirit in your life, to metamorphize you, to guide you, to look for his work in you and through you. And as you consider that this week, I want you to think and remember about this. The Holy Spirit will never tell you to do anything contrary to the words of Jesus and will always act in a way that stays in the background showing the spotlight of glory on Jesus Christ. So my encouragement to all of us through this week is to really make the Holy Spirit a more active part of your life. First of all, by loving Jesus more. He then becomes an ozonator against sin, if you know what that is. Ozone is the most deadly substance known to man. The Holy Spirit is the most deadly substance to sin. He becomes a PhD in our knowledge of God. He becomes a global positioning satellite system for direction in our life and our work for the Lord. He becomes a massage and calm music in the midst of the storms of life. And then finally, he becomes a way for us to hold a spotlight not upon ourselves and what we are and can do but instead upon Jesus and who he, he is so that others will love him too. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we invite you to invade us, to fill us, to come into our lives through the love we have for Jesus Christ. We pray that you would take up permanent residence in our hearts through our relationship in you and that you would begin to work and turn us from ugly, slow, dumpy caterpillars into free and beautiful butterflies. We don't understand how that process works, Lord, because we're not you. But we want to cooperate with that process, Lord. We want to help draw that cocoon around ourselves. We want to munch upon your word we want to focus our relationship on you and love you more and more each day so that you will have more and more free reign in our lives to move and to work and to change and then also, Lord, to glorify yourself because you are worthy of it. Make our lives ones that glorify you. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.